On the 5th of June 1916, Field Marshal Horatio Herbert Kitchener was killed when the ship he was travelling on, the HMS Hampshire, was sunk off the coast of Orkney. 800 miles to the south, in a small terraced house in New Haven, Eliza and David Browning first heard about the tragedy on the front page of the next day's paper. All but 12 of the ship's 758 crew had perished in the waves. Their 20-year-old son, able seaman Harry Browning, was among them. At the same time as the nation mourned the sudden, untimely death of a national hero, the Browning family grieved the loss of a son and brother. This was a family, like so many others, who had answered Kitchener's call on the front line, on the high seas and on the home front. And for the Brownings, it had meant paying the ultimate sacrifice. New Haven is a port town in East Sussex on the south coast of England. In peacetime, Eliza and David Browning shared their home with their four children. The eldest, Frank, was a railway telegraphist in 1911, whilst Harry, then only 15, was already working as a sheet maker. Two younger daughters, Harriet and Dorothy, were still at school. There's a really strong community spirit in the area that um, Harry lived. He lived in a railway road, which was part of East Side. There's a, an infant school in Railway Road, which is still there, so he would have gone to the local infant school. Uh, once he was um, a bit older, he would have gone to the boys' school. The declaration of war in July 1914 would change the lives of the Browning family and New Haven forever. The harbour town had long been an important transport link between London and Europe, and in wartime, New Haven port provided a vital shipping line between Britain and the Western Front. Over the course of the war, over 6 million tonnes of supplies, including 2.6 million tonnes of ammunition, would be delivered to France during supply trips. But it wasn't just New Haven's infrastructure that would be pressed into service during the war, but also its population. Men clambered to join the fight, filling the ranks of Britain's army and navy. Because it was such an important port during the war, um, the garrison at New Haven uh, went from around 200 men before the war to over 4,000. So there were a lot of soldiers that were both training for war that had come from all around the country, um, but were also here to defend the town and the port from uh, either invasion or from uh, attack from uh, submarines. They joined a lot of the naval services, either Royal Navy, the Volunteer Reserve, or the RMVR, so that's the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. So when you add all those up, looking at the uh, men in the town, there were more of those that had some sort of uh, connection with the sea uh, during the First World War than actually with the army, although the number in the army were more particular regiments they weren't. Frank, Eliza and David's eldest son, knew the port well, having worked on a ship owned by the Brighton and South Coast Railway in peacetime. On the outbreak of war, Frank Browning served as a radio operator on a mine laying ship, carrying out important work defending the transport lines between Britain and France. Even though uh, Frank was in the Merchant Navy, it was no less safe. And it was important work that they were doing as well. So even though they were merchant seamen, um, it, was, um, it was dangerous. The huge demands of the war on manpower saw roles traditionally reserved for men, such as postal staff, opened up to women for the first time. In the first two years of the war alone, 35,000 women joined the post office. Harriet Browning, who was only 16 years of age in 1914, became New Haven's first postwoman. It was not long before others followed her example, as the country attempted to manage the huge amounts of posts circulating between Britain and the Western Front. And there's some lovely photographs of, of New Haven postal women, and there's a story of a woman who had her bike stolen because they had to buy their own bikes and she had her bike stolen by a Canadian soldier who was trying to make away with a parcel of sugar. For the youngest son, Harry, the war must have seemed like an exciting prospect. Like many other young men in New Haven, the Royal Navy presented the opportunity for adventure on the high seas. Harry was soon assigned to the HMS Hampshire, an armoured cruiser. He was proud of his ship, going so far as to intricately paint her on an ivory nut brought home from some exotic shore. The Hampshire completed several missions in the Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. At about quarter to nine in the evening of the 5th of June 1916, faced with stormy conditions and within two miles of Orkney's shore, the HMS Hampshire struck a mine laid by a German submarine. 
Within 15 minutes, she had sunk. Seven hundred and forty six lives were lost. The telegram, delivered to Harry's mother, told his parents all they needed to know. Their son was lost. Harry's name can be found on the memorial plaque in St. Michael's Church in New Haven, as well as on the town's war memorial. Tragically, Harry's brother Frank would also fall victim to the war. On the 14th of November 1918, just three days after the declaration of peace, Frank succumbed to an illness in the Siemens Hospital. His name is also recorded on the list of war dead. For Harry, Harriet and Frank Browning, and a generation of young Britons, the war would irreversibly alter the course of their lives in ways which we cannot even imagine today. It is a sacrifice that New Haven and the nation will never forget.